We were a bunch of naive kids, traveling abroad in 1992, and our two-week beach vacation turned into two nights of terror. Ever since our sophomore year, my high school gang of friends dreamed and planned for an epic trip to Cancun, Mexico. One of us saw a movie and thought it would be an amazing destination for us to escape the New England winter and celebrate surviving the high school experience. There were six of us in on the plan. There was Keith, our unofficial leader, who lost his dad in his junior year, so the trip became our way of making him think ahead to something good. Then there's Greg and Kirk, who were big history and archaeology buffs, so they were as interested in the Mayan ruins as the beach and beer. Next were Dorothy and Hannah, who were gamer girls, a rare thing in my area, and were up for a trip to the beach with their big brothers. The last one was me. I was simply looking forward to having an adventure. Unfortunately, we couldn't go the year we graduated. Some of us had to put our savings towards college or other expenses, and two of us got jobs that wouldn't allow time off. Despite this, we had a pact to make it happen. A year passed, then another. It was five years before Keith phoned us up to say he had booked not just a room or a suite for us, but an entire house on the beach for two weeks. There were five of us back in our hometown for the holidays, so we met up at a bar, had a great reunion, and Keith showed us the brochure he received from the travel company. The place was gorgeous, almost gaudy in its gold trimmings and ritzy amenities. Clearly, the house was going to be too expensive, even split six ways. But it wasn't. In fact, it was a bargain for two weeks. What's wrong with it? This was Kirk's question, but we all thought the same thing. Keith explained that the hurricane that swept through had depressed the local economy, so these outlying properties were booking like crazy to try and keep up with the more prosperous city of Cancun. The house was nearest to the village of Puerto Juarez, but near all the same attractions as Tulum and Ux Mall, and we could go to any beach we wanted. We could take a boat trip to Isla Mujeres, or even Belize, for a third of our original estimate. We tentatively agreed, because we knew Keith vetted the place before committing to it. He had already put down the deposit and set the weeks based on the hold we all put on the calendar. It was late in the season of the following year. The truth was, we were all getting older and moving on. Some of us were in relationships and planning weddings. Greg had a baby on the way with his fiancée, so time was running out on our childhood dream before we could part ways for good. Fast forward nine months and the day arrived. I had digested travel guides and had everything I needed. I took the cheapest flight, which meant layovers and switching gates, so I arrived later in the afternoon. I happened to meet Dorothy at baggage claim. We remarked how grown up we both looked, shared a couple of hugs, and agreed to share a cab to our vacation villa. We waited in a long line to be paired up with one of the taxis lining the arrivals terminal. We got caught up on the latest gossip and life events. We had officially entered vacation mode. Dorothy was getting married in the spring and moving to Europe. Unfortunately, Hannah had to back out at the last minute because of work, but she sent her love. When it was our turn, we paired with this old rusty bucket of Chevy steel, driven by an older man who swept us away with the grace of a ballroom dancer and the smile of a car salesman looking to make his quota. His name was Paolo, and he wasted no movement getting our bags into the trunk and us into the back seat. Where we go, folks, he said. I gave him the address, and he just looked at me in the rearview mirror. Eh? He said, confused. I repeated the address, and he nodded, 
still somehow confused. After reporting to someone on the radio and including the address twice, it sounded like the dispatcher was even a little confused. He switched turn signals and began to merge right against the flow of traffic exiting the airport toward the city. He quoted us a price and I agreed. We headed down an empty lane into the growing shadow of dusk while most folks were headed into the bright lights of Cancun. The road was two lanes and covered with litter. Shortly beyond the on-ramp, we passed a tent city, crowded with people, torches being lit to illuminate families living in squalor, toddlers and children without clothes sat in the dirt and under makeshift tent homes. Further down the road, beached vessels lay on their sides, sunken into the sand or soil. Families with the means had converted them into homes by cutting holes into the hull to make doorways and windows. Stray, skinny dogs and cats patrolled the road for food, stopping to glare as we drove slowly past. There were a few people on the road in the growing darkness. We had moved into the long shadow of the Yucatan rainforest on a road following the beach. The ocean was dazzling in the early evening, and Dorothy focused on that while I kept an eye inland. Paulo, too, wasn't as cheerful or talkative once he knew where we were going. He asked, You know people in Puerto Juarez? I shook my head. No. A friend rented a house, I replied. Rented a house, he nodded, pretending to understand, but remained skeptical. It's very dangerous place. Must be very careful. Dorothy stiffened in her seat a bit. We had entered the forest just a bit, which obscured her view of the beach. She looked at me as if to ask, what did we get into? A mile more down the road, we emerged from the trees to again drive along the beach. Inland, bright, jaundiced security lights bathed the strip mall which included a market and a couple odd shops. Only the market was open, and a half dozen or so taxis were hosted with the drivers enjoying beer and soda in the parking lot. Paulo honked and waved as we passed them, and they all cheered. Paulo smiled wide, and the presence of pleasant people relaxed us a bit. His smile faded as we went around the corner. Soon there, he said, as if to reassure himself as much as us. Another half mile or so, and the road was dark. In the headlights, we made out some figures in the distance standing in the road. It was a few teenagers. A couple held flashlights, and all of them carried heavy sticks. Paolo began to slow down. Gang of kids, Paolo said. They want to collect a toll. Dorothy grabbed my arm. I had heard about something like this. How much, I said. Paulo shook his head. We no stop. He accelerated toward the kids on the road, and at the last moment, they dove for the shoulders as the taxi roared through. Dorothy dove into my lap, and I ducked down as the back of the taxi was pelted with rocks. We continued on. Paulo got on the radio and reported it, then mumbled something to himself perhaps regretting getting this fare. We arrived at the address shortly after. Despite the photographs emphasizing the dazzling facade and gardens, the exterior of the property was wrapped in a 20-foot wall of concrete blocks topped with a layer of lumpy cement into which hundreds of jagged bottle pieces were mounted in place of what might have been barbed or razor wire. The driveway was blocked by a tall steel gate and an intercom. Paulo had us buzz in. The gate whined and scraped open against the corrosion and lack of lubrication, taking forever to open wide enough for us to enter. All the while, Paulo and I kept watch on the darkness for signs of those kids from up the road. As soon as we got into the property, Paulo kept saying, Close it up. Close the gate. 
as he pulled under an overhang at the front door. Fortunately, the gate began to close. The front door opened, and our three buzzed dude bros poured out onto the driveway. They fireman handled our luggage into the house, and we all began to hug and laugh. Paulo kept watch on the gate, distracted as Keith asked him about the possibility of driving them to Chichen Itza the next morning. Late, of course, so they can sleep in and have breakfast. Once the gate closed, Paulo was himself again. Sure, he would be happy to take three, maybe four, in his taxi. It would be an all-day trip and quoted a price. Keith agreed, and Paulo prepared to head out. You keep the place tight, so the bedbugs no bite. I come back nine tomorrow, said Paulo. Keith let the warning slip over his head. It occurred to me that he, Greg, and Kurt got there during the day and likely had a much more positive experience than we just had. Paulo waited outside the gate to make sure it closed before driving off. I also noticed he was returning to town with a wingman and a taxi who turned around on the road to tail him. The house had been carefully photographed to avoid capturing the ugly concrete walls. Some of the walls looked to have been recently rebuilt, and the older blocks had holes in the interior wall patched with cement. We went inside where the guys had already started playing D&D and drinking. The interior of the house exceeded the grandeur alleged by the photos. The place had a sunken living room with comfortable sofas and chairs, a spiral staircase up to the sleeping level, and a massive dining area with a chef's kitchen attached. We got the quick tour of the place, but Dorothy and I were both exhausted from a day of travel, capped by the ride from the airport. We both had cervezas from the fridge, noting that the pantry had been stocked by the owner prior to our arrival. Keith had already cooked dinner, but we were able to feed off the remaining fajitas and bowls full of junk food on the gaming table. I didn't want to roll up a character so late in the evening, but I hung out at the table with my friends, happy to listen to the pattern of our gaming once again. We were all older, spoke a little slower and thoughtfully, but it was like being home. One of the things I noticed about the house was that it didn't look out onto the beach, at least not directly. The tall concrete wall blocked the view from the first floor patio. The pool was lit from inside, casting the yard in a peaceful blue glow. Linking the property to the beach was another tall steel security gate through which I could make out a narrow sliver of light of the rising crescent moon. This made sense in a way, because under Mexican law, all beaches were public spaces. The property line ended at the wall. My thought was interrupted by something Keith said. The phone doesn't work. What? I replied. Yeah, we were tired so we were going to call for a taxi to take us into town to a restaurant. But the phone doesn't work, replied Keith. I felt a bit nervous about that. None of us had cell phones. Keith, however, didn't seem bothered. The owner's great. He lives in Puerto Juarez. I'll get in touch with him after we get back from the pyramids tomorrow night, he said. Dorothy and I had not planned to take the day-long trip to the pyramids. We both planned to ease into the vacation by taking a trip to the beach and getting tanned. I wasn't comfortable with spending the entire day without a lifeline. It wasn't an insurmountable problem, and I started working out ways to maybe take a cab into Puerto Juarez in the morning with Keith to see if I could fix the problem. It was then a loud buzzer sounded, and all of us jumped. The sound echoed through the entire main floor, coarse like a game show buzzer sounding an incorrect answer, except longer. As soon as it stopped, it buzzed again. Keith got up from his chair again and walked over to a small alcove, presumably to open the gate. Don't open that gate, Dorothy and I said in duet. Kirk and Greg laughed. Keith stopped and shot us an odd look as the buzzer sounded yet again. I'm not, he said. He opened a panel in the alcove that contained a small security monitor and an intercom. He squinted to see what was on the monitor. I stood up 
and walked over. As I did, Keith muttered, Bunch of kids. One kid was mugging for the camera and crushing the buzzer. It was a fuzzy image, but the fisheye lens and the security light gave us a look at about 10 people. Not just kids, but men, women, and a few dogs milling about among them. The one gazing into the camera wanted to be seen. It might have been the lateness of the hour, or my own paranoia, but I recognized him as one of the kids blocking the road on our way to the house. Ignore them, I suggested. The buzzer went off, and everyone got annoyed. Dorothy put her face in her hands. It bothered her more than the rest of us for some reason. Can you kill that effing buzzer? She asked. Keith shrugged. I don't know. I... He searched the intercom and hit the power button. The buzzer ended abruptly. It seemed as though the kid mashing the button knew this was because he immediately stopped and stepped back from the panel. He glared at the camera, the light washing out all his features except eyes full of mischief and maybe a little anger. The group huddled together in small groups, backs turned to the camera. Keith, unnerved by this, flipped the power back on and pushed the talk button. I didn't have time to say anything against this. Hey, what can we do for you guys? Keith said. The group left hard and loud enough for us to hear them from inside the house. The kids stepped up to the intercom again, pressed the talk button. It said something in Spanish that I barely made out to mean he wanted food and booze and maybe to come inside and party with us. In English, he added, We can bring in women and some ganja. Have a real good time, see? We all looked at one another, not to discuss the proposal, but the ridiculousness of it. Keith replied, Sorry, we're all partied out, thinking of calling it a night. The gang outside talked amongst themselves for a bit. The spokesperson considered this and then hit the talk button again. No, I don't think you sleep tonight. The group then ran off in different directions, the spokes kid grinning wide as he glared into the camera and backed away. He left the camera heading around the exterior wall. Dorothy stood up and went looking for something that turned out to be a bottle of tequila. She was shaking. Greg went to talk to her because they had always been close. I learned later that Dorothy and her fiancé were victims of a home invasion six months earlier in Baltimore. They were tied up and robbed at gunpoint in the middle of the night. This was a massive trigger for her. We need eyes upstairs, Keith said. Someone needs to be able to see over the wall. I have a security camera here and there's beachside. Kirk and I took the spiral stairs up to the landing. Keith called up to us. Keep the lights off. We did. I went to a beachside bedroom and peered out the sliding glass door to the balcony. There was no window overlooking the side of the house. They were probably clinging to the wall to avoid being seen. I sat on the king-sized bed and quickly decided that was a bad idea because I immediately felt sleepy, despite the adrenaline of being put under siege. So I stood up. Just then, a volley of stones rose from behind the wall. A dozen or more softball and golf ball sized stones caught in the light of the pool area, smashing down on sand and concrete. Some made it to the balcony, bouncing off the metal railing before rolling into the pool. The crackling stones sounded like gunfire, and Dorothy screamed from the other room. Immediately, the backyard and beach were flooded with white light from the towers erected at the corners of the property. The jagged glass atop the wall sparkled, and I could see shadows cast toward the surf and the tops of heads as a small group stepped back and launched another volley of stones, some aimed at the lights, while others came soaring at the patio windows. None of the rocks aimed at the building reached the windows. They bounced off the railing or the patio overhang. The rocks aimed at the lights just bounced off without effect. 
Kurt called my name from the front of the house, and I rushed out of the room, down the hall, and into the smaller bedroom, where he was pointing out to the front wall. Someone had thrown a heavy blanket up over the top of the wall. A thick one, like the moving blankets they rent at U-Haul. We made out the top of a ladder. I looked around and for whatever reason, picked up the old clock radio beside the twin bed. I yanked the cord out of the wall and wrapped it around the clock. Kurt gave me the look he gives when I do something stupid or pointless in our weekly D&D game. It wasn't until I got outside on the patio that my conscious brain caught up to what I was going to do. Just as a man's head peeked up over the wall, I launched the clock as hard as I could, like a frisbee, across the yard, thirty feet or so in his direction. It flew low and to one side, but it shattered when it hit the glass and concrete, showering the man with shrapnel. It hurt and startled him enough that he slipped off the ladder out of sight. He landed with a crash and a painful cry. The floodlights burst to life in the front of the house, lighting up the road beyond. A handful of frightened kids scattered, carrying their friend who looked really hurt. The sound of stones hitting the house continued out back, and there was shouting. Kirk ran back to where Dorothy and Greg were, huddled together in the bedroom. I heard him shout, Make sure they're not scaling the wall out back, or charging the gate. Convinced they had abandoned their charge on the front wall, I returned to the rear bedroom and gathered the white stones that had ended up on the patio. Plumes of white smoke rose from outside the wall, curling in the security lights. Some more rocks flew into the yard, but they were weak hurls, landing in the pool with no effect. With about eight stones in my arms, I returned to the main floor. Keith was in the alcove, switching between three monitors and a black screen. They got the one side camera, he said. What the hell are they burning? I asked. Keith replied, I think they're burning the beach furniture. Half of them ran off. The ones in the back are older and... Someone started launching Roman candles at the house from the beach. Dorothy began screaming again as fireballs struck the overhangs and sliding glass doors. Bottle rockets followed along with an assortment of small explosives. A couple of quarter sticks landed just inside the wall and the concussive power rattled the windows. One destroyed a deck chair and turned the small flower garden into a crater. Then it stopped. The security lights remained on for five minutes until a lack of motion reset the compound in darkness. We had to adjust, and it was a frightening moment as Keith scanned the security cameras. For a long while, there was no sign of any of them. Kirk suggested they ran up the road or the beach. But then, the kid from the monitor walked up to the front gate again, a big grin on his face. He was carrying a handgun, displayed clearly for us to see on the monitor. He shook it for the camera and pushed the talk button. No, I don't think you're going to sleep tonight. He then spit on the camera and walked away. None of us slept, except for Dorothy, if you count passing out from tequila and terror sleep. We estimated we had about seven hours until dawn. Kirk argued that everyone who came out was either asleep or celebrating their victory over the tourists back at whatever clubhouse they shared. He wasn't ready to sleep though. We sat in candlelight to get the best view out the windows. Greg patrolled upstairs for a while and then joined us in the dining room. The doors were open and the screen shut so we could hear anyone gathering out back, but only heard the gentle roll of surf. If they come back, the lights will go on, Greg said. If the police drive by and see that rug on the wall, maybe they'll check in. To be honest, we hadn't seen any lights except that of the moon on the ocean since the gang departed. It was a beautiful scene, to be honest. I tried to relax and had a few Coronas to help. 
we started telling stories of her glory days to keep awake and even had to hush ourselves to keep from waking Dorothy. It was around 3 in the morning when the security lights out front flared again. We didn't even have the energy to be startled, but responded immediately to it. I checked the security monitor. It was a couple of people there to collect the ladder and the rug. Pulling the rug down triggered the lights, and they quickly ran off back up the road into the dark, tiny pixels of light shown in the distance as they switched on their flashlights. The rest of the morning remains a fuzzy memory. I may have drifted off, and so may I have the others, but none of us slept. Sunrise gave us all more confidence, and Keith immediately conspired with Greg and Kirk to power nap before Paulo returned to take them on the all-day trip inland. I said we should go to the police and get the phone fixed before the three of them left the property in the hands of an exhausted me and an already terrified Dorothy. Shortly after dawn, Dorothy came downstairs in a swimsuit, walked past us without a word, and walked into the pool. She dunked herself and began fishing stones out from the bottom. I helped Keith make breakfast, and things began returning to normal. Keith agreed to postpone the trip until we could file a complaint and get the phone situation settled. We ate and agreed to ask Paulo to put us in touch with the authorities. When the buzzer sounded again, we all jumped a little, but it was Paulo. We led him into the compound. He was dressed for comfort, ripped jean shorts, and an old golf shirt with sandals. We explained the night before, and he didn't seem surprised except for the part about the phone being out. He walked with Keith around the outside and confirmed his suspicion that the line had been cut outside the wall. The line could be fixed, but just as easily cut again. With this done, Keith phoned the owner to let him know what had happened. According to Keith, he feigned concern and promised to use his connections in Cancun and Puerto Juarez to increase police patrols the next night and hand over the security tape to the officers who would come and investigate. Convinced this solved all our problems, Keith, Kirk, and Greg left the house late to put in a full day hours away at the Chichen Itza site. Paulo pulled me aside and handed me a small metal case. He patted me on the shoulder as if confident I'd know what to do with it. Inside was a handgun and two magazines. Startled, I took it inside and wiped it down for prints, but I kept it in the kitchen. Dorothy said nothing all day after getting out of the pool and showering. She sat on the patio outside the dining room and read a book. When the police showed up four hours later, I brought them in and explained things. One of them spoke English well enough and explained that the house we rented had been owned by a local drug trafficker. He wasn't exactly a kingpin, but he was able to keep up a nice residence until he was murdered. It was bought up by a local businessman, but tourists, for some reason, didn't like the idea of being this far from the well-protected tourist zone. The kids were probably locals with nothing better to do than harass Americans, and we should relax and have a good time. They didn't even bother to see the playback. They just took the VHS tape and wished us well, assuring us that a car would drive by at least once an hour overnight. I didn't mention that a lot could happen in an hour's time. I kept checking the phone line as if the sudden lack of dial tone was my first alert for trouble. I thought that if they could cut the phone, they probably could cut the power almost as easily, but I didn't share any of this with Dorothy. I made lunch but Dorothy didn't want to eat. She didn't want to talk either. She sat tensely in the sitting room with her book. I collected stones from the pool area and piled them by the door. I cleaned up the debris and then spent some hours soothing my nerves with beer, Jimmy Buffett songs, and a network of pool noodles serving as my raft. The guys never settled on a time they would return. Apollo said not to even try, because they had to drive through the jungle and there might be any number of delays or detours. It was best to be home by sundown, 
So when the sun fell behind the trees that second night, and they had not yet returned, I started to get concerned. There had been talk of playing a D&D adventure, or just some card game that night, so their intention was not to be too late. Dorothy had taken a nap in the middle of the day, but never went back outside after her swim. She returned to her chair with another book, and went right into it. She refused dinner, but I made her something anyway, hoping the smell would jumpstart her appetite. I felt like a well-treated prisoner. People walked along the road, outside the compound, sometimes peering into the upstairs windows to catch a glimpse of us tourists. Others lounged on the beach beyond the gate. It was probably safe for us to go out there, but we weren't taking the chance. In the end, the night fell over the house again, with just Dorothy and me inside. When the security lights went off again, it was around 8 in the evening. I had drifted off. I looked out the front side of the house and didn't see anyone outside the wall. When I got to the front door and looked out the peephole, I saw one man standing in the yard. He didn't have a weapon in his hand, but I wasn't sure if he was armed. He just stood there in the floor lights, staring at the front door, then to one side of the unused garage and then to the downstairs bedroom window on the opposite side. Dorothy got up and went to the phone. There was a dial tone, but dialing 911 left her with a dead line. She tried a few times without success. At that moment, the buzzer sounded. Fearing another attack, I retreated to the security monitors and saw Paulo's cab outside. I buzzed them through. When the gate began to move, the man in the yard fled toward the back of the house. It took a while for the car to get inside, and I moved to get the gun from the case in the kitchen. The man raced to the back gate. As I suspected, it was accessible from the inside, and he threw it open. As he did, about five men rushed forward, only to be stopped by the man inside and motioned to run which they all did. With the rest of the gang back in the compound, Paulo told us he radioed police when he saw a bunch of creeps outside the wall. They were at the market and were on their way. The three men were deeply tanned and a little drunk from their experiences which they promised had a moment like the night before. Soon after, the police arrived outside the compound and they interviewed Paulo and the rest of us. They had Polaroids of the people they caught near the marketplace and took our word when we positively identified them as the man in the yard and the others trying to get in. It was all they needed to not only arrest them, but round up the other kids who harassed us the previous night. Settling in, I returned the handgun to Paulo, but he offered to sell it to me for 50 bucks. I can't say if I took him up on it or not but the rest of us felt a lot safer the remaining 12 days of our trip. We even took to the beach as a group. It took a while, but Dorothy began to settle in. After three nights of no issues, we all slept through the night and had the adventure we'd been dreaming about for eight years. <laughs>